Thanks for checking out this movie review video. So this is for the 1975 Italian giallo film Eyeball, and it feels nice to get back to something familiar, and by that I mean this is an Umberto Lenzi film, and I've actually reviewed a bunch of Umberti Len Umberto Lenzi films. Sorry about that. Um, actually, I have back here, right there, the uh, Lenzi Baker collection, which I have reviews for all of those. That's so Sweet, So Perverse, A Quiet Place to Kill, and Knife of Ice, and Orgasmo. So I did all those in addition to Seven Bloodstained Orchids. So those are all on my channel. I think I actually created an entire playlist for Umberto Lenzi films, and this one will be going into that as well. So I'm familiar with his style, so I watched those other films not long ago. So to watch this after not watching a, a Lenzi film in quite a while, it, was, it felt comfortable. I was like, yeah, yes, I remember this style. And when I say style, I mean he does a lot of zooming, and he also has a tendency to do every now and then, I think he just did it maybe once within this film, the thing that Mario Bava had kind of pioneered, I believe he pioneered it, but he used it a lot, which is like kind of having the camera on a character and then rotating it kind of like semicircle around that character, either from the front to the side or back or the other way around. So he definitely did that at least at one point in this film, and he's done it in other films as well. But that's very much a Baba thing. Anyway, like I said, directed by Umberto Lenzi. He also did Seven Bloodstained Orchids, Orgasmo, A Quiet Place to Kill, Knife of Ice, So Sweet, So Perverse, Spasmo, which I think will be the next Giallo I review, actually, so I'll be getting even more Lenzi, Eaten Alive, Cannibal Faro, Ghost House, and Hitcher in the Dark, those are not all of his films, but it's just a sampling of the films, and I would like to see all of those. Written by Lindsay, as well as Felix Tussell, who didn't write any other scripts, so one and done for Tussell. Now, you may notice that the guy who plays Reverend Bronson in this film looks familiar. That's because that is George Regard, who has been in a bunch of other Giallo films, such as A Lizard in a Woman's Skin, All the Colors of the Dark, Death Walks on High Heels, The Case of the Bloody Iris, and Knife of Ice. So obviously he had worked with Lindsay before. This film is also known as Red Cats in a Glass Maze. Gotta love that title because it's just ridiculous. Um, but I love, you know, I love those weird, ridiculous Giallo titles. I'm all about it. Love it. So the way this film starts, obviously you're seeing Alma at the airport, I believe. Yes, I believe it's at the airport. And she seems really spaced out. And I think that the reason that they kind of introduce Alma in that way, obviously that is Mark's wife, is because, who he's cheating on, is because I think it's supposed to set it up as in a red herring for like she's kind of losing it, she's kind of crazy. Because Mark has that conversation with Paulette later in the film about how she's kind of had like a mental break, he needs her to go to a facility to get well basically. And then you start finding out that, oh, it's potential that Alma is in Barcelona, which is where they are in this, not actually filmed in Italy, it's in Barcelona, Spain. Um, and then you're supposed to think, as Paulette had intended, obviously, that Alma was there carrying out the murders, when actually it would just end up incriminating Mark. So that is why I think it was important that they kind of showed Alma spacing out, because it lays the track for the audience to believe that She's not right that there's something going on, and then that could lead to murder. Because with these films, that's kind of how they did things. The Spanish tour guide, Martinez, is something else. Uh, he loves his scare gags. That's the other thing. He kept doing, like, the, the little uh, wind-up mouse, the little wind-up uh, spider. Uh, got a real kick out of trying to scare people. And I kind of thought that he was so off that he may have ended up being the killer. So I did kind of guess Paulette much later in the film, but very early in the film I was kind of guessing Martinez because he was such like a peripheral character, but they showed him enough and in weird ways that I was like, maybe it's Martinez for that reason, but it wasn't. But he's an interesting character. I, I liked him in it. One of those quirky characters that you always end up with in Giallo films and one of the reasons I love Giallo. So Mark showing up right after the first murder is supposed to cast immediate suspicion on him. Then they point him, point to him as an immoral person as he explains that he's going to be leaving his wife for Paulette, who obviously at that point is his secretary. So the old trope of the boss sleeping with his secretary, 
we got that going on, and obviously Paulette is fine with this. She wants to be with him, but she also plays like she feels kind of bad, and I think that conversation is important because it kind of establishes that Mark's not all that great of a guy, so it's supposed to cast suspicious on him, or suspicion on him, but at the same time showing that Paulette is acting like a very nice person and saying, oh, I really love you, but I don't want you to you know, divorce your wife and leave her for me, and I feel bad. So you're supposed to be endeared to Paulette and think she's a good person, therefore eliminating her from your list of possible suspects. And also the fact that they make her the love interest who usually is not the killer in these films. The love interest usually ends up being a secondary character that's very important to the story and is almost like a second main character. And for that reason, you just wouldn't assume that that's going to be the killer. So good job on kind of laying that red herring down there. I like the lights and quick cuts that they use when they had the horror tunnel scene that leads to that stabbing within it. Uh, it kind of added to the intensity of the actual stabbing when it happens. Uh, the, all those quick cuts kind of disorienting, the flashing lights, the kind of scary, crazy faces. Uh, it just adds to kind of the terror of the moment. And I like that they did that. Good job, Lindsay. Mr. Hamilton's odd behavior with the straight razor is a big red herring moment. They threw a lot of these kind of like random red herring moments into the film. The one where he was shaving and then he's just like staring a little bit while he's holding his razor. Then he goes and like watches his daughter Jenny just like sleeping. And it's kind of like, it's supposed to be creepy. It's supposed to make you think, oh, maybe he's thinking about killing her. He could be the killer. So just another one of those red herring moments which, like I said, they put a lot in here. Yes, uh, by all means, handle a bloody knife you found on the floor, Mark. Idiot. Mark is an idiot. When he goes to Alma's room at the hotel and is let in, and he finds the bloody knife on the floor, he just picks it up, and it's like, now your fingerprints are on it, dude, and they did do fingerprinting back then. Nothing with DNA at that point. It was definitely too early for that, but fingerprinting they were doing. So you're an idiot, Mark. Total idiot. Uh, it was just kind of a funny thing because while it was happening, I'm like, Mark, what the hell? But obviously that whole thing was a setup. He was supposed to find it. He was supposed to basically incriminate himself. Yeah. Why does Reverend Bronson pop up everywhere? I think kind of a reason for Reverend Bronson just continually popping up in the most random places was because, A, I think it seemed like he was kind of going along with the tourist group. But there are other times he just pops up randomly, and I think that was intentionally there to kind of cast some suspicion on him as well as potentially being the killer. Because if you've seen enough, enough Giallo films, being a man of the cloth does not disclude you from being a murderer. In fact, that's used a lot of times in Giallo films, including ones I've reviewed very recently. No cuts on Ronnie, or I'm sorry, now cuts on Ronnie's hand. That's yet another red herring. After the one girl was killed at the farm and the pigs started to eat her, I guess that's what that looked like was going on, um, and they point out that Ronnie has these cuts on his hand all of a sudden, uh, it's just another one of those red herring moments that you're supposed to point at and be like, oh, he could be the killer now. The business with Alma supposedly being in Barcelona but not being seen by Mark is suspicious, and it made me think that it was all a ruse. That's when I started to really feel like there was someone else doing this. And that's when I thought, well, it's probably Paulette because she, I assume she had some sort of feelings about the fact that he was still technically with Alma. And I think maybe she also feeling bad about the whole thing was like, you know what? He shouldn't be two timing his wife. And so I thought for that reason, she was trying to set him up basically and maybe come after him to kill him. But obviously that's not what the end ends up being. But that's when I started to suspect Paulette because who is close enough to Mark that would be able to set him up with those types of things and have the knowledge about Alma and everything. So I would pretty early was kind of like, yeah, it's probably Paulette. So yeah, not sure. I believe Mark about how he found Alma with the bloody knife and the eye. They definitely do make it seem suspicious. My thought was that Mark, I was thinking that Mark was going to end up actually having murdered Alma, but not ending up murdering anyone on the tour. So I ended up being wrong about that. Obviously, um, Alma's actually still alive, so I don't know what the deal with that whole situation was uh, about her being dead. I don't understand. Oh, no, I'm sorry. That ended up not being Alma. That was 
what's her name? Terry Moore, I think, was the was the the person who was dead. Yeah. Sorry. Got confused for a minute. That's what Giallos will do to you. Lisa's death is a pretty solid one. There is a decent throat slit into that at that point in the film, but for the most part, the kills really aren't that great in this film, in my opinion. I mean, they do a good job with the music, they do a good job with the camera work and everything, and you know, the stabbing the stabbing motions look real enough, but there's just not enough blood. There's just not enough like up close, except for that throat slit. It just leaves a bit to be desired for me. Another red herring with Reverend Bronson showing up at the hospital and Naiba getting chased by the killer right after Reverend Bronson shows up. That is obviously supposed to make the audience think that Reverend Bronson is the killer, but it's this weird coincidence where Reverend Bronson realizes, oh, I should leave these flowers here and go do something else first. Just one of those things. Convenient. Why is the killer all of a sudden unable to finish the job? That's one thing I didn't understand. In the very beginning, Paulette is good at just killing people and in pretty obvious places and not getting caught and finishing the job really fast. But then all of a sudden, as the film goes on, as we get towards the end, she's trying to kill people, but she can't. So I'm wondering what the disconnect is there of her being so good at killing and then not so good at killing. Maybe it was a situation where like she was more getting into kind of a unbalanced mania towards the end so that she was having kind of focus issues. She was just getting sloppy. I don't know. That's kind of my theory on why that happens. Maybe I'm thinking this through too much. I'm probably thinking too far into it, but yeah, just wondering. Interesting, but if information about the same colored eyes being cut out. Uh, sorry, I wrote that all messed up. It's, in it's an interesting bit of information about the same colored eyes getting cut out of each of the victims, and I think that's what, what's his name, Tulad, Inspector Tulad, that's what he kind of brings up, is that all the women who have been, or all the people who have been killed and had their eye cut out have the same color eye. Like, that's interesting. Not a bad misdirect with Reverend Bronson seeming like the killer when he talks to the girl in the castle, the one who finds his photo. is like, oh, is this your photo? It definitely seems like this creepy moment where, like, he's on the edge of about to kill her. So they did a good job kind of setting that up, but obviously he ends up not being the killer, and they find him <coughs> totally killed. Uh, I suspected Paulette is the killer, but it was smart to set her up like the lit, uh, love interest. It keeps suspicion away from her. I kind of talked about that a little bit earlier, so we don't need to go further. Uh, Paulette's friend pulled her eye out while playing doctor. This is a weird thing. Um... You know, a lot of the times in Giallo's, when you're getting back to the motive of the actual killer, they're usually kind of thin. And this one's crazy thin. Uh, the fact that she's, like, traumatized because she has a fake eye, because when she was a kid, were, she was playing doctor with a friend, and they pulled her eye out. First of all, how did that happen? That It's really hard to believe that that would happen at all. And then the fact that that just made her crazy, and she went over the top, and now she wants to kill people and cut their eye out. Now, it did look like, when you see her killing the person at the end, it did appear that she was going to put the eyeball she cut out into her own socket. Isn't, comment down below, do you also think that that's what was going on? Because it, it looked like she was kind of moving that way, and then they kind of cut it off real quick. But I don't know if that was her thing, that like she liked to feel like she had a regular eye. I don't know. It was interesting. But that whole story is hard to believe. So Paulette seems to have scared Mark back into fidelity in the end. Obviously, Mark is scared because he was all about Paulette. I assume they have been sleeping together. And then he finds out that she's a murderer. And that obviously scares him right back to Alma because he's like, you know what? Let's work this out. We don't necessarily have to get divorced all the time. Before that, he was talking about how they're going to get a divorce. And that's what he wants. Totally changes his mind as Paulette scares him back into the arms of Alma. What's the purpose of having Inspector Tudela, that's his name, it's not too loud, Tudela. What was the purpose of having him hand the reins off to Inspector Lara at the end? It was such kind of like a weird way to kind of leave the film before you go to the credits because it doesn't really matter. It's not about the inspectors really. Yes, they're there and they're obviously playing an important role of 
trying to solve the case, but they're not really important characters in the film, and I just don't understand why you would just like end it with them. Uh, it would make sense if it was if this was mainly about the main inspector and his career and everything, and the fact that then he's handing off the reins to the younger inspector. But to end it like that is just like why? Like this doesn't even matter. It's weird. So this this film actually does move at a pretty good pace. Uh, it's like uh, an hour and a half ish. I think it's a little bit longer. It's like one an hour thirty eight. I think. It is, and it moves at a pretty good pace, um, so I was pretty happy with that one. I like the commonality of the eyeball being stabbed, but the kills are lame. I already talked about that. I like the whole eyeball thing, but the kills are lame. Obviously, that's why the film's called Eyeball. It's an interesting idea to have people getting picked off within the same tourist group. I've never seen that done before, and so I thought that was a cool, interesting new thing that could be added. So I like that premise. I'd like to see some more people kind of play with that premise in more horror films in the future, maybe. That'd be fun. Maybe some updated giallos. I like how characters have a tendency to step into frame in a weird, abrupt manner. I don't know if anyone noticed this, but those moments where a character would step into frame, a lot of the times it's it's very abrupt. It's not like they're, they're walking up in a normal manner where like they're taking a few steps into frame and then stopping at some point, it's literally they're taking one step and stopping. It just makes it seem so uh, purposeful in it and fake, basically. Like, they're standing, like, right off frame, and then they get the cue, and they take one step into frame. And it just looks so fake. It makes it look so fake. I don't know if anyone else picked up on that, but that kind of bothered me a little bit. But they did it numerous times within the film. It was weird. Um, Lindsay loves his zooms, lots and lots of zooms. Uh, he, Lindsay can sometimes get on my nerves with all his zooms, but for the most part, I like his films and the way he directs and the cinematography that usually goes along with it. Uh, also a pretty solid score to this film. I was really digging on the music, so I was enjoying it. That was a good time. So out of five stars with half stars in play, this is a good solid giallo film, but I don't think it's anything super special. I enjoyed it enough, so out of five stars with half stars in play, I'm going to go three. I'm going to go three stars on this one. I was toying with three and a half, but it, that just doesn't feel right to me. But, love to hear your thoughts on it. If you have seen this film, go ahead and put the comments down there. Your thoughts on Eyeball. Also, if you just want to talk about Giallo in general, we can get nerdy about that, because obviously, I also love Giallo, and I'm down. Uh, do me a quick favor, hit the subscribe button if you haven't already. I would really, really appreciate that. It's quick, it's painless, it costs you no money, and it really does motivate me to keep this channel going, to keep doing these review videos and all the other ones I'm doing. And it means a lot to me. Uh, I'm very thankful when people do subscribe. So if you could do that for me, that'd be awesome. Also hitting the notification bell button, because then you'll know whenever I'm putting up new videos, which is usually around four a week, sometimes more actually, depending on what's going on. So. Would appreciate it. But regardless, I do thank you for taking your time to watch this. I do appreciate that very much. And until next time, keep it brutal.